This video is brought to you by the Latinx Center for Excellence in Behavioral Health at UC Berkeley's School of Social Welfare. With the advent of the coronavirus pandemic in 2020, most mental health services went from being provided in person to being provided virtually, either by telephone or video chat. We at the LCOEBH were interested in seeing how this unintended experiment was going. So we asked six talented local BIPOC behavioral health providers. In this video, our experts describe the challenges and successes they've encountered. They also share their best practices in regards to telehealth. Yeah, I, I do think the benefits really, I mean, there's a lot of things that we've had to struggle with, but I think that you know, the benefits far outweigh all the issues that we've had. Uh, it's just amazing that we're able to reach so many more patients. Uh, I mentioned that sometimes patients answer and they talk and they're not interested, but oftentimes there's a lot of logistical issues preventing, preventing people from coming into the office. Many people um, might be day laborers right. who, you know, coming into the, into the clinic, even if I see them once every few weeks, like that's a day that they don't get paid. Right. It's a lot easier to say, to step away while they're working and take a quick, quick phone call. So it really reduces a lot of the disparities and issues of access to care. We, we have a lot less people that aren't showing up and that means we're, we're talking and helping more people. Um, I can be more flexible with appointments because if I have a list of people that like my schedule gets really filled, I don't have control over it. Sometimes I wanna feel like somebody, I wanna reach out to somebody and have a visit, but I don't have any availability for three weeks. And you know, if I have any time, if somebody cancels, if somebody just doesn't pick up the phone when I call, I can call someone else. And so it's really flexible for us. Yeah, it's, it's like we went from something like, like not just me, but the behavioral health team, we went from something like 40% no-show rate to like less than 20%. Wow. It, wow. Is, it is really remarkable. I mean, it, it's, I think the biggest benefit is we can still do the, the work we're doing. I mean, that for me, that that's a huge benefit, right? I mean, we're able to still provide therapy and support for people. And like I mentioned before, people are, you know, they feel good just getting a call, knowing that someone's checking in on them, especially right now when so many people are, are isolating and practicing social distancing. Uh, a lot of my uh, senior patients tell me constantly, like, I wait for your call. Like, no one visits me. You know, my kids call me, but no one can physically visit me. And I don't talk to them about these things. I don't tell them how I feel because I'm worried that they'll get sad or they'll be worried about me. But when you call, it almost feels like a release for me. Like, I have, I have this, uh, this feeling of, like, I know someone's going to check up on me. And I can tell them everything that I'm thinking, everything that I'm feeling, and it feels good. And so for me, that's the biggest benefit is just being able to continue doing this work that is so important, uh, especially right now that the big focus is on, you know, on the body, right? Of course, with, with the pandemic, right? We're all worried about getting sick, but we don't talk about the mental health piece a lot. And I've had people put me into in between their lunch break, <laughs> you know, they're like working and I'm their lunch break and we're talking through video and this is great. And then they feel good and then they leave and you know, next session, I'm like, oh, that was so helpful. I got that mental break. And then I just went through my day and finished. And it was it was great. Again, th this change in terms of we're going into the space, it reminds me more of like home visits, which yeah. I've done in the past. Yeah. You know, that I'm literally visiting with my clients now um, in their home space. Yeah. And so for those clients who have the technology on their phone um, or just have the ability to kind of manage the Zoom window, you know, they may have more privacy might, that might afford them more privacy. Yeah, that's actually, yeah. Um, and, you know, or maybe they take a walk. Maybe they're walking around the block while they're talking, um, while they're talking to us. Um, and so, but, but I think for those clients where um, I'm in their home, 
Um, I've had, I think about one client that I've used in video with in particular, where there's been something really sweet about being in her home space because she keeps, she, she, it's not unusual for her to grab things from her home space and say, let me show you this, you know, and that's amazing. Like she's shown me artwork that she's been working on. Um, she's wanted to show me certain, um, she showed me a picture um, a family photo on her wall, you know, I mean, I get to literally, you know, sometimes, you know, I've had clients who kind of take me around the house, <laughs> you know, I mean, it's beautiful, right? I mean, it feels very, really like a privilege. It feels really honoring, deeply honoring, but it also feels like there is a level of intimacy potentially, right. Right. you know, um, there, which can be really powerful. They may be in bed when we're having the session. That's actually not unusual, you know, and for my clients who are very depressed, yep. who are struggling to get out of bed, maybe it's okay that I'm, you know, that I'm talking to them because that's where they're at on that day. Um, it, 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 there's a lot of opportunity, potentially a lot of opportunity there too. And you just get a lot of information. For the most part, I've, I've just adapted tools that I already had and kind of just, you know, try to change them up, modify them as best as I could. Um, I tried to use the screen share option on Zoom and we've been able to do uh, like watch YouTube videos, listen to songs on YouTube um, while we're doing therapy. Uh, I've also found um, a resource where it was kind of like a board game, um, mm -hmm. which mm -hmm kind of worked, but didn't work too, too well, but it was, it was something. So I would play a board game virtually with them through the screen share. Um, and uh, doing a lot of like psychosomatic stuff where they practice kind of like doing touch for themselves. It's kind mm -hmm. of create like a, I guess a, a sense of touch presence. Um, mm -hmm. And yeah, but it's been, it's been rough. It's been <laughs> difficult to try to figure things out. You know, for the young people, students that are hardest to reach. I mean, the learning pods have been um, profoundly helpful. Um, Can just, you describe those a little bit? Yeah, so they're basically like um, in-person, small group learning classrooms um, at schools. And okay. they're typically set up for the, you know, the students that are just not tapping in um, to their virtual classes from home for whatever reason. It, it could be like a Wi-Fi issue, but it could be not a Wi-Fi issue. So, um, so I think that's been helpful just in terms of uh, addressing the the lack of Wi-Fi. Uh, I think the biggest thing is like flexibility, and you'll probably hear me answer a lot of the questions with that um, being flexible, um, and and you know really trying to just be understanding. I mean, you know, it part of my job is to help folks like feel relief. And so I always kind of go into it the mindset of like, if I'm causing stress <laughs> in just this process of being connected, then I'm, I'm already setting my clients back or setting us back in that working relationship. So really being flexible and then really being clear around what the expectation is and, mm -hmm. and that, there, that there is flexibility and that, you know, what communication I do really need to hold them to. So that way we can be effective and, and build on the relationship and also have some consistency. Um, so I think being flexible and really being clear uh, has been helpful. I mean, I think that actually I'm using email more than I ever have. Um, and, you know, and so creating also some, some expectations and, you know, managing expectations and boundaries around, um, around that because, you know, email is primarily for, for scheduling and coordinating. It's, you know, I'm not responding to it before this time or after this time. Um, and here's where I, I would like you to get access if you're, if you're in a crisis, this is, this is how we, you know, this is where I'd like you to, you know, um, like you to reach out for that to be able to get support. You know, what's nice about email, it's on most people, it's on a lot of people's phones. And so, you know, for those who use email, it's actually been a really, it's been really helpful as a way of staying in communication, using that, um, honestly, more consistently than the phone sometimes. 
was learning just this week about using email to text, which I haven't played with, but I think would be wonderful. Um, I have, you know, from colleagues, again, just continuing to learn. And I know that so many, so many more people are, are, you know, using texting. And so I would love to play with that as a way of staying in touch with people. But I think that um, some of the things that stood out for me, I don't know, this one thing that's coming to mind is, is this idea of just how to create, because in the therapy space, when we're in person, even without us realizing that there's certain rituals that kind of help create containment for that space, you know, in our, you know, office space, we have like pastries or, you know, or we have, you know, tea or coffee or water, you know, there's a whole um, ritual really of how we bring that person back to the room what are our new rituals going to be? You know, what can those new rituals look like? Um, because to hold that virtual space, I might, depending on the client or what sort of challenges I know come up for them, might say, do you need a minute to get to that space? Um, you know, where we actually, where the session begins. This is a ritual that's very tied to this particular kind of processing work I'm doing with some clients, but like for some clients, you know, it may be, you know, at, at some point, one or one of us saying, okay, we've done the work we came to do today, you know, or something to really acknowledge mm -hmm. that space and mm -hmm. to transition mm -hmm. out of that space. Um, I have a client when she is having her dinner or watching a movie or using that in a social way, she doesn't, she sits in a different seat and her, and she has her therapy seat. So she changes to another part of the table for our session. And that's part of her stepping into that therapy space. I have a colleague who used to joke about her about her commute home, where she would, the folding table where she does her, her sessions, she would fold it up, she would put away the folding chair, she would put it, she puts it in her closet, and then that's her commute home, you know, and I would say, enjoy your commute. <laughs> I'm, I'm laughing because I'm thinking about all the little things that I had to go through when I first set up. Like, uh, I, I at first I left my door open, my dogs would walk in, I wouldn't notice, and they'd start barking. And I'm like, oh my gosh, okay. Uh, you know, I think for me, tips was just to remain patient, right? To try to uh, even, like I said, use the humor. Like, I'll, I'll, my, my patients will sometimes say, oh, is someone taking out the garbage? I'm like, oh yeah, it's Monday. I'm sorry. <laughs> I completely forgot. Uh, it'll be like a minute and we'll sit there and like in video and like we'll laugh a little bit and they're like okay I'm like they're gone and then we'll just talk a little bit more you know and kind of just utilizing it like I said things like this happen and with technology you lose connection you lose the, the uh, you know the audio um, sometimes you don't notice things in the background <laughs> you know? so uh, I mean all of those things I think it's just for me it's laughable so I, I and I think a lot about the humor piece and I think that's something that I would I would suggest is just laugh at some of these things because we're not perfect and we're doing the best we can and technology is not perfect either and it does mess up and it will mess up <laughs> you will have moments where you're like oh my god like this is horrible i can't hear them or the the video went out and i say just be flexible um i do tend to check in with them a lot more okay how are you how is this for you how does this sit with you just because I don't, especially over the phone, if I don't have that feedback, I really have to be checking in more. You know, there are many, many people that I've seen for months and I've never seen their face. They don't know what I look like. <laughs> So I, I, I've thought of a few things. Um, well, I talked about the opportunity that it presents around like bringing in family members more, but you know, the other thing I've wondered about, um, so, you know, so often, so we're, you know, school-based, we're in multiple schools and several school districts and, you know, uh, where we provide the social welfare supports, you know, we have like individual, like family group work. And I've wondered about if we're in a couple of middle schools providing telehealth, right? Is there a way if we have, I'm just thinking about like a boys group focused on self-esteem, right? Is there a way to maybe have one group across the three sites where, right. um, where the youth are, well, getting 
more varied support, you know, from their peers, but also they're having an opportunity to socialize with different school students, like communities. Yeah, I mean, I think, you know, I mean, there are the whole restrictions around licensing and being able to provide therapy across state lines and, you know, continents and all that. But I think ultimately, like, you know, in the future, future, like it could create a level of access to people. And so, I mean, so many different, I mean, just business wise, I mean, you know, the amount of stuff that we can do, the type of communication you can have with folks and access you can have with folks just increases. I think, I think it definitely can be an, a great opportunity to, to, for folks who are, who have social anxiety, who have challenges with, you know, being face to face. I mean, I think it can open up a, a, a great opportunity to access those type of folks. And the, I think the more education around it, the more it's offered and the more exposure that folks can have to it, you know, the better. Um, I've definitely thought about doing like some group type stuff and creating kind of networks that way. Um, not even just doing therapy, but just like support for, you know, for folks. Um, and that's not something that I had thought about in person, but I think if I did it remotely, it just expands that outreach. Being able to collaborate and partner with other clinicians, other people doing the work, I think um, it, that the possibilities with that are infinite as well. So. Dependency on technology now and just how it's improved so much has opened the door for a lot of possibilities. I mean, we can see patients now and so that I actually do work with patients in SoCal and you know, San Diego and Los Angeles a little bit further up north in California. And it's great. I mean, we have, we're, we're able to provide services for a wider uh, area for more diverse uh, clients. I mean, I think it's wonderful. Uh, but at the same time, I, I think that it's just another option for people who don't have any therapists of color in their area and want to work with someone specifically who's BIPOC. That's another big thing for me that I love about this is that I've heard from people tell me I live in this small town all the therapists are white there's no gay Latino or you know um, transgender therapists or any of these people and now it's like we don't have you don't have to live somewhere close to like a city to have that I already have clients that are telling me that, that they don't want to meet in person <laughs> and that they want to stay like this so I I mean it, it does provide a bit more access to some people that just maybe they can't commute or maybe they just don't have uh, as much time. I don't know, I feel like there's more access to it. Um, I, I think that we're gonna need to start training for telehealth in general, like in schools and, and outside of school once you're actually in practice. Um, and I, I don't know, I don't know what it's gonna look like, but I agree. I think it's, it's here to stay and it's gonna be much more prevalent.